Good evening. Thank you for attending the Baltimore County Executive's third budget town hall for District 6, hosted by your County Executive, Johnny Olszewski Jr., and your County Councilwoman, Kathy Bevins. I'm Amanda Carr from the County Executive's Office of Community Engagement, and I am pleased to introduce to you Abby Slocum, my colleague and your community out coordinator. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here tonight for the 6th District Town Hall. As Amanda said, I'm the 6th District Outreach Coordinator in the County Executive's Office of Community Engagement. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Abby. In a moment, I'm going to turn it over to Councilwoman Bevins, but first I want to thank those of you who submitted your questions in advance. The County Executive, one of the, one of the department heads who are on the call, or Councilwoman Bevins, will answer as many of your budget-related questions as possible tonight. For those of you who are watching through social media, you may submit your budget related questions in the comment section. These will be answered after the county executive's budget presentation. If we cannot answer your question tonight, we will have Gabby Slocum, your district six representative, follow up with you. And now it is my honor and privilege to welcome your councilwoman, Kathy Bevan. Uh, thank you, Amanda. Thank you for that introduction. Um, good evening, everyone. I especially want to thank our county executive, John Oshesky, uh, for continuing with these town hall meetings again this year. And I think it's very important that the citizens of Baltimore County see where their tax dollars are going and for what projects and what each uh, dollar is being spent on. And just for the transparency of the um, uh, process. I also would like to thank all the directors. I know that we have probably over 50 directors and support staff uh, standing by to answer uh, any questions, including um, uh, my staff is here as well, Doris Polling. And these are all the folks that get up every day and oversee these agencies and offices to make sure that um, the services are provided to you, the citizens of Baltimore County. I also would like to thank everyone that has uh, tuned in this evening. Um, it means you're engaged, and that's a good thing uh, when we have citizens engaged. Um, it's definitely been a very uh, trying year uh, for most of us. I, I find very few people that have not been affected uh, this year, especially by COVID, and I know that'll be, I'm sure, talked about this evening. Um, but we have weathered the storm, and I really am grateful to the leadership of um, Council, I mean, um, County Executive uh, Oshesky for his leadership and the health department and the way they have rolled um, these vaccinations out and the way that they have tested people. And it's been a very difficult year, I know. Um, and I'm sure that the budget that I'm about to see uh, may uh, reflect that in some way, shape, or form uh, for the upcoming um, year. Um, but I also know that the county executive understands, as well as the council members, that we need to continue services for the citizens of Baltimore County, which means all our um, essential, you know, trash pickup and snow removal, um, as well as uh, supporting existing infrastructure, new infrastructure, as well as education. Um, so I really look forward to seeing um, the proposed budget, and I look forward to the discussions um, with ourselves and the citizens of the 6th District and anyone else that may be out there this evening. Thank you. Well, with that, thank you, Councilwoman Bevins, uh, for that introduction and for those welcoming remarks. Thank you, Amanda and Gabby and everyone on the Office of Community Engagement. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight for the 6th District Town Hall. Uh, it is good to be with everyone, even if just virtually. Uh, it is particularly an honor to be here alongside Councilwoman Bevins, who has been a great partner on the County Council. She has been also a trailblazer on the council and in Baltimore County. And uh, I look forward to having her help us kick off our Women's History Month series uh, Thursday night uh, to talk more about her experiences. So tune in again on Thursday um, and help us kick that off. I want to also echo the councilwoman's thanks and praise of our departments in Baltimore County. Uh, we have exceptional leadership and almost every department has a director or deputy director here tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled to be working alongside uh, the councilwoman, our departments, and all of you towards a better Baltimore County. Because over the past two years, with your help and partnership, we have set new and higher standards in local government. 
and a new and better way of doing things in Baltimore County. We came together last year under a very different set of circumstances, working with you all and with the councilwoman. We had closed an $81 million deficit. We had put the county's fiscal house in order, and we had maintained our AAA bond rating. Uh, those ratings were again affirmed uh, today. We put out a release. So again, even in the midst of this pandemic, our AAA bond ratings have been affirmed and actually upgraded uh, to a, a more stable outlook. Um, from one of the agencies. So it's been really good news on that front. With that stronger financial footing, we were positioned for incredible progress. Uh, we had en enacted unprecedented ethics and accountability reforms. We were releasing uh, public data dashboards. We were becoming much more available, new levels of transparency coming to Baltimore County. And we were set to build upon our record funding for schools and investments in all of our communities. Then obviously COVID-19 upended our entire way of life and changed everything. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were forced to work with our partners on the council to cut $100 million of spending from last year's budget. But we still managed to pass a budget that focused on our essentials, education, public safety, and those critical services our residents depend upon. We also began preparing for an unprecedented crisis, the likes of which none of us had ever seen before. In March of 2020, the county recorded our first case. Now we have over 50,000 confirmed cases. We unfortunately lost over 1,200 of our neighbors and loved ones. Countless residents have lost their jobs or their businesses. Over 245,000 Baltimore County residents have had to file for unemployment claims at some point during this crisis. But within weeks, within weeks, we built a COVID-19 testing operation, which has now provided almost half a million tests free and without a doctor's note. We were doing PPE distribution and we created a contact tracing operation. And we've seen the opportunity to step up and meet the immense needs of our communities because we believe local government has an obligation and a responsibility to help people meet their most basic of needs. And we are meeting that need. Together, we've distributed over 13 million meals in partnership with Baltimore County Public Schools and our public library. We also have partnerships with the Maryland Food Bank, local businesses like H&S Bakery, and our local Baltimore County farmers. Through our eviction prevention program, we have distributed over $5 million to help save 1,400 households uh, avoid eviction. In June, we started phase one of that eviction prevention program with 1.2 million going to nearly 485. In phase two, we allocated $5 million in partnership with nonprofits like the Community Assistance Network and Catholic Charities. And through these initial phases, we found that the majority of applications for rental assistance came from the nine zip codes with high rates of housing instability and poverty, in addition to high rates of COVID-19 transmission. So thanks to an innovative partnership with the United Way of Central Maryland, we provided 4.2 million to help over 900 households stay in their houses and not risk the spread of COVID-19. We look forward to doing more on this front. And I'm proud that Councilwoman Bevins and the council recently approved uh, a grant that we secured of $24.7 million from the US Department of Treasury through its emergency rental assistance program. We estimate these funds should help us assist at least an additional 1,250 county renters. We're also closing the digital divide in Baltimore County. We are providing six months of Comcast internet essentials to a thousand moderately and moderate and low income houses. We created a program to help low income families pay for childcare, supporting those who have had children in remote learning, but who couldn't afford it. We're also proud that we created a similar program to help county employees who have school aged children. And we're doing all that we can to help our neighbors, residents and businesses alike get to the other side of this crisis. That is why we've provided millions of dollars to restaurants and businesses, helping them to stay open and millions more to help keep their staff and customers safe. In total, we've awarded over $21 million across six different programs to 1,350 different grant applicants. Over 13 million of that 21 million has gone to restaurants specifically. Through our small business reimbursement grant program, we've helped nearly 300 businesses install equipment to prevent the spread of COVID. We've distributed over $4 million as part of our small business relief grant program. And over 50% of all of our grants have been awarded to minority and women owned firms. Now this is a grant volume that's at least 20 times our normal workload, which is really impressive that we've been able to do it quickly and efficiently without requiring additional staff resources. 
Now, with the arrival of the COVID vaccine, we see the light coming at the end of the tunnel. And our first, first vaccine was distributed on December 23rd. To date, over 122,000 Baltimore County residents have been vaccinated. That's nearly 15% of our residents, and over 72,000 have received both of their doses. We have consistently been a leader in the state for the number of residents vaccinated among local jurisdictions. And we're capable of administering 1,000 doses per hour at just our state fairgrounds clinic. Not to mention, we're also working to expand our access, having opened new clinics at CCBC Essex just last week, which followed our second clinic at the Randallstown Community Center. We're also now partnering with Uber to give anyone without transportation access to a county-run clinic. In addition, our health and fire departments are working to vaccinate anyone who can't leave their homes. But we can do so much more, and we know that so many others are still seeking a vaccine. But we ask for your patience because we have continually only received a limited number of vaccines in Baltimore County. So in the meantime, let's keep doing all that we can to stop the spread and save lives wear your masks, and practice social distancing. You know, even amid this crisis and in the response to COVID-19, we've continued our work to improve our communities, taking significant actions to reform county government and move Baltimore County forward. And I'm really proud of what we've accomplished together over these past two years. In the sixth district specifically, we have dedicated over $175 million to improve our schools. That includes $56 million for a new elementary school at Ridge Road in Nottingham, <laughs> and $103 million for a new middle school in the Northeast, which is now currently in the design phase. Now, the county portions of these schools have been secured for years, but thanks to the blueprint for Maryland's Futures Passage, we will finally receive the state share and can move forward on these critical projects. In addition, we have millions more budgeted for maintenance and repairs at schools across the district including new roofs at Chase Elementary School, Parkville Middle, and Overly High. Meanwhile, we're continuing to explore plans for a brand new Northeast High School as we work with BCPS to finally develop a long-term school construction plan. So moving forward, we'll keep doing all that we can to best meet the needs of every student and every community. At CCBC, we recently completed the construction of the Carol Diane Eustis Center for Health Professions, the county was proud to put forward $30 million to support the construction of this $65 million facility. It is an incredible place. And we have over $421,000 budgeted to renovate the Rosedale Library's bathrooms and meeting room. Protecting our open space remains a top priority, so we'll also continue to do all that we can to, to ensure access to parks across Baltimore County. We have budgeted over $2.8 million for improvements to Rec and Park facilities in District 6. That includes the design for new PAL centers in Middle River at Glenmar Elementary School and in Rosedale at McCormick Elementary School and a new skate park at Hazelwood Park, which is in the design phase. I want to give Councilwoman Bevins a lot of credit here, a lot of advocacy on her part, and we were really proud to have been able to make sure um, all of these projects are happening. Uh, we're also continuing to invest in our rec and park facilities across the district, including renovations to baseball fields and rec centers, as well as our multi-purpose courts at Elm Elmwood Elementary School and at Harvard Park Community Center. Double Rock Park is slated to receive $285,000 of up upgrades for parking and drainage. And moving forward, we are continuing to plan for a new park in the Northeast area. We're proud to have budgeted a record $35 million for recreation and parks in our most recent capital budget referendum. We also have an obligation to make sure we are maintaining our infrastructure and providing for critical services to our residents. We have budgeted hundreds of millions of dollars to improve and maintain our water and sewer system. And we're proud to have budgeted record funding for road resurfacing. Our team has resurfaced 35 lane miles across District 6. And we remain committed to doing all that we can to ensure your communities continue to thrive. Thank you for your partnership in these investments in District 6. Across Baltimore County in our first two years, we provided back-to-back -back years of record funding for public education, including over $240 million towards those shovel-ready school construction projects. And coupled with that state funding, we will be prepared to finish the county schools for our future program and begin to further address other long-term needs. That's why we're so glad to see the General Assembly has overridden the governor's veto of the blueprint for Maryland's future 
which has now also unlocked that $462 million of school construction under the Built to Learn Act. The blueprint will also help us raise teacher pay, make key investments inside the classroom, and ensure that all of our children have the resources they need to succeed. As we continue to strengthen our schools, we also are working alongside BCPS and a nationally recognized consultant, Canon Design, to develop a long-term plan that addresses our school construction needs. Throughout this process, collaboration with all of you is important. So we want to make sure we're forming a long-term plan to ensure that every child, every teacher, every family across Baltimore County has access to a world-class learning environment. And as we invest in our schools and our educational system, we're also doing all that we can to keep our community safe. And I'm proud to report that Baltimore County remains a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. Violent crime rates declined over the past year, which has continued a multiple years long trend downward. So I wanna thank Chief Hyatt and the Baltimore County Police Department for their efforts. Last year, we shared our update to our crime fighting strategy, which included enhanced data and analytics, increasing crime prevention efforts in hotspots, and participating in the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. We are truly starting to see the benefits of having these measures in place. And now you can also track our crime data using the new dashboards we released just last week. That can be found at baltimorecountymd.gov slash bcstat. This past summer, we also heard calls for justice across our state and across our country. And I'm proud to say we answered that call, becoming the first jurisdiction in the region to take a major step forward. With the bipartisan Smart Policing Act, Baltimore County has banned chokeholds, required de-escalation and implicit bias training, prevented officers with prior records of misconduct from serving in our department, and codified many other reforms that were already un underway. We've also, in a bipartisan fashion, increased transparency in the police department setting up the data dashboards that track use of force by and complaints against law enforcement and creating the county's first ever policy requiring the release of body camera footage. Baltimore County is also taking on the, taking on the opioid epidemic head on. And as we continue to have the second highest number of opioid related deaths in the state, it becomes imperative that we remain focused on this issue. Now, fortunately, we have not seen the dramatic spikes uh, that other jurisdictions have seen during this crisis of COVID-19, but we do continue to lose far too many of our loved ones to addiction. That's why in our first year, we hired the county's first opioid strategy coordinator, and we began developing a comprehensive plan to end this epidemic. We are now in the process of expanding harm services reduction, like needle exchange programs and drug drop boxes, we're increasing access to treatment with a new center in Owens Mills and another center in the planning stages. We're also partnering with Shepherd Pratt Hospital to develop a hub and spoke model for treatment in Baltimore County. Treatment that's focused on individuals with dual, dually diagnosed disorders and those who have both mental health and struggle with addiction. And we will continue to look at all options to increase access to treatment. Residents in Baltimore County also deserve a jurisdiction that remains vibrant and livable for generations to come. It's why we must enact sustainable practices that also protect our planet. So we are instilling a, a culture of sustainability throughout county government. Over the last year, we began developing our first greenhouse gas inventory and countywide climate action plan. In partnership with Councilwoman Bevins and, and others in DPW and all of you, we were able to renew and restart our glass recycling program that stopped back in 2013. And we're pursuing new innovations like converting methane gas at our landfill to renewable energy, offsetting an estimated 21 million kilowatt hours of county electric usage annually. We're also committed to increasing funding for Reckon Parks. I mentioned the $35 million, which is a record investment for our Reckon Parks facilities. We also doubled our funding for ag preservation. We also have issued an, an executive order requiring new county buildings to be built up to lead standards. And we just partnered with bg and &E and saw electrical vehicle charging stations throughout Baltimore County. So we will continue to do all that we can to ensure a more sustainable Baltimore County for future generations. But we know that our commitment to sustainability also has to be reflected in our approach to transportation. We wanna think bigger and more creatively about how we do it. So in Towson, we're proud to be launching a Towson Circulator this year. It's something we hope to replicate in communities across Baltimore County. In Middle River, we recently received our second ever state transit-oriented development designation. 
at the site of the former uh, aircraft manufacturing plant, um, the former Martin facility, which you all may know. It's nearly 2 million square feet of redevelopment and a, a project called Aviation Station, something I know Councilwoman Evans has been um, helping to promote and make come to life for a very long time. To reduce congestion, we're also exploring other ways to move forward and imagine new possibilities, things like micro transit and, and dense transit oriented development in places where it makes sense, like Aviation Station. And we remain committed to maintaining our existing roadways to keep our residents safe, which is why we will keep up record funding and road resurfacing for traffic calming projects. <clears throat> our infrastructure is more than just transportation though. We also are looking at our water system and the policies governing our water system are decades old. They're older than I am and they're in need of reform. So we are partnering with Baltimore City on a comprehensive review. And I look forward to working with Mayor Scott to modernize these critical services. Another area where we need action is waste disposal. Trash from our landfills has increased from 304 tons per day to over 1,400 tons per day. So in October, we created a work group to, to develop a five-year solid waste plan. And we issued a survey from residents to gather input about how our trash and recycling services could be improved. So we're committing all of our efforts, all of our energy to do whatever we can to keep our community sustainable and vibrant. And we're proud of the work that we're doing and the ways in which it's paying off in our communities and in our matrix. Uh, we will continue to make upstream investments to strengthen our neighborhoods and support our young people in particular. I'm proud that we expanded our summer youth program for uh, youth workers, even amid a pandemic. We provided them new opportunities to hundreds of people, giving new skills, experiences, and connections to 280 participants, which was a 44 increase, 44 percent increase from the year before. Uh, and we look forward to growing this program further in the years ahead. I mentioned the planning of the construction for the PAL centers in Rosedale Middle River. And across Baltimore County, we're making efforts to revitalize our main streets. Towson is thriving and has been named a Maryland, Maryland Main Street affiliate. Reisterstown has been named our county's second Main Street. And Catonsville, Music City, Maryland, became our first ever arts and entertainment district. Closer to you all on the east side, Trade Point Atlantic is continuing to breathe new life into Sparrows Point and is one of the biggest e-commerce hubs in the country. I'm proud to have the support and the partnership of Councilwoman Bevins to help lead Baltimore County in a way that is more transparent, open, and accountable than ever before. We passed together an unprecedented ethics package that resulted in lobbying reform, a now successful charter amendment to establish public financing of elections. We created the county's first ever inspector general. And last year, we took a number of steps to heighten accountability, launching BC Stat, our data-driven performance management system, creating data dashboards to increase accountability in county services, and creating Open Checkbook, which was an expansion of our open budget platform that now allows you to see county spending down to the contract level. We worked with the county council to move work sessions later in the day. We created an office of community engagement to ensure that every district has a dedicated representative. We established a 311 line. And just last week, we launched the county's first ever enterprise-wide operational efficiency audit, which is a chance to rethink government operations, improve our services, and find meaningful places we can save money. We'll be working with a national firm called Public Works LLC to develop a roadmap more efficient and more effective in our operations. We will continue to do all that we can to make Baltimore County more transparent and accountable, especially as we head into recovery from COVID-19. Speaking of recovery, after facing an unprecedented crisis like this, our region must work together to pick up the pieces and rebuild. And as we rebuild, we must make a concerted effort to address the disparities that have always been there, but have been laid particularly bare by this crisis. We can't just rebuild our economy. We have to improve on it. And our recovery must be holistic. We wanna bring bold actions to strengthen our business community, support our residents and address inequities in our communities. So as we recover, we will be putting an emphasis on supporting small and independent businesses on our main streets. And we will target our resources to those businesses that were hit hardest, like restaurants, movie theaters, and event venues. We know that some industries like hospitality and tourism have bore the brunt of the pandemic's economic impact. So we'll also think creatively about how to support them. And we'll work with regional partners to build a robust tourism strategy that highlights our homegrown assets right here in Baltimore County. 
rest assured, all options will be on the table from leveraging loan guarantees to investing in our main streets and business corridors to expanding our small business resource center. Because recovery works best when we are big and bold. It also works best when it's done in partnership and with an open dialogue. So I look forward to hearing from the business community and from you about ideas you'd like us to explore. Because when this pandemic ends, we have to resolve to come back stronger with family supporting jobs. Doing more with things like the Job Connector Program and expanding free co community college through the College Promise Program. So in April, I will introduce the fiscal 22 budget to Councilwoman Bevins and the County Council. And the council will have until May 31st to approve it. As you know, in addition to the council, you have an important role to play. So Councilwoman Bevins and I look forward to hearing from you tonight about your priorities for our budget. Uh, together, we can set our shared priorities, plan for our recovery from this crisis, and ensure we're positioned to come out stronger when we get to the other side. So with that, I will open the floor. I think I will be turning it over to uh, Amanda to uh, go over some uh, ground rules and how to submit questions. We'll start with answering a few of the questions that came in ahead of time, and then we'll go back and forth uh, between live questions and those that were pre-submitted. And Councilwoman Evans, as we're answering, feel free to chime in as you have anything to add tonight. Thank you, County Executive. Thank you. Um, before we start with the questions, I just want to thank everyone who submitted their questions in advance. We have them, and the County Executive will be answering those that pertain to District 6. Um, and a reminder for those of you watching through social media, you can ask in the comment section or chat feature um, of YouTube or Facebook, and they will be forwarded to us and the county executive will do the best he can to answer them live. If we cannot answer your question tonight, we will have Gabby Slocum, your outreach coordinator, follow up with you. Mr. County Executive, are you ready? Let's do it. All right, first question comes from Christy. A good number of your constituents live on or near waterfront areas in Baltimore County, whose property values and the ability to use their property depends on protecting these waterways. I'm a relatively new resident to Baltimore County, moved here in 2018, purchased a home in Bird River. As a resident with a young family and hoping to live here for a long time, I've been increasingly concerned about what seems to be the deprioritization of maintaining or restoring rivers and streams that have been irreparably damaged by development and erosion issues in the past few decades. It seems like there were concerted efforts to make amends for damage allowed by the county and state, but those efforts have now fallen by the wayside with a dredge project that is now delayed by several years. Um, homeowners recently being informed that requests for new spurs, which were due to come at a significant cost to homeowners paying for the spurs anyway, are being canceled because they would damage the river and require expensive mitigation. Can you address the current state of the dredging project and can you specifically explain how state environmental officials came to the conclusion that new dredging would cause damage? Hey, thanks, Amanda. Christy, thank you for your question and for uh, tuning in tonight. I'm actually going to turn uh, things over because it's a technical question on uh, re state regulations and requirements to uh, Mr. Director Dave Likens of our Department of Environmental Protection and Sustainability. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. And uh, Christy, thank you for your question. That's a great question. As you know, we were planning to do dredging in Bird River in co coordination with the state. We were paying for half of it. The state was paying for half of it. And as we went through the permitting process, what we found out from the state, we, we had exist, we have dredged Bird River several times in the past. And so what the state decided was that the areas that we had dredged in the past did not require any mitigation this time. However, new dredging areas, for instance, some of the spurs to um, citizens docks were, were new areas that hadn't been dredged before. And they decided that we had to mitigate for those areas. So as it turned out, the mitigation in many cases cost more than the actual dredging itself. And as you said, the citizens had to pay for it themselves, but they were paying sometimes $20,000 for a spur, but $30,000 for the mitigation. And the county had to front the mitigation up front. The entire project cost about $2.2 million in our estimate. And at the end of the day, the mitigation was going to be another $1.1 million. So what we decided to do was we decided it was not prudent to spend that much on mitigation for the new spurs. And we decided to continue with the existing areas that we had dredged before. And we do have a permit now to go forward with that uh, 
information and that dredging. And we're just gonna start, um, put, put out the bid this spring and hopefully um, start October 15th of this year. You're allowed to dredge between October 15th and February 15th in order to protect fish habitats and submerged aquatic vegetation. So we're hoping to have a permit start this year for the main channel itself. Those people that did not have their spurs dredged in the past that were excluded from this permit are still able to go out on their own and try to get permits to do it themselves through the Army Corps of Engineers. So the county did make a decision because the mitigation was so expensive to eliminate new spurs from this particular project. So I hope that answers part of your question. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, and in addition to that, that answer, you know, uh, Gabby, your District 6 liaison and Director Likens and DEPS will be happy to provide the resources as we start that dredging project um, about how residents who were not um, otherwise included to have an opportunity to um, access that dredging. So. Okay, Kenny Kellner from Facebook said, asks, Baltimore City Partnership with lift, okay, let me restart that. <laughs> the Baltimore City Partnership with lift to help people like me get essentials. How has the Baltimore County, how has Baltimore County explored this option to help people like me who cannot get the essentials because of lack of transportation? Thanks, Kenny, and uh, th I appreciate you uh, uh, watching tonight. Uh, what I can tell you is we re just recently announced a partnership um, with Uber about uh, getting people access to these vaccination clinics. So anyone who does not have transportation, who has an appointment can call 311 uh, to get uh, a ride to a vaccination center. Uh, I know that we also have uh, lots of opportunities um, that we're exploring as part of our recovery package where we're not just having, it's not just about businesses, but about people. And so um, we are trying to find ways to expand uh, public trans transportation options. And so uh, if there are ways to sort of further out, further um, expand access to essentials, we certainly uh, are going to be looking at that. And if you have a specific need, I'd encourage you to reach out to your uh, Office of Community Engagement Liaison um, or send me an email and I'm happy to make sure we make the connection. Bill asks, Please consider the Elmwood section for speed bumps or a way to slow traffic on Westfield Road, Westwood Road, Springwood, um, et cetera. We know the community has been turned down because traffic is light. The traffic that goes through speed and run stops regularly. Thanks for that question, Bill. What I can tell you is that I have consistently pushed um, our teams to think differently about what eligibility looks like for speed humps. There are there are obviously some fiscal constraints in terms of how many we can do in a given year, but in terms of eligibility, um, I've really worked with Director Walker, De Director DeAndre Walker, and she has recently been appointed. She's been very open-minded about trying to work with, with the communities that uh, if there's not a reason for public safety, for example, to not do it, and if the community overwhelmingly wants to see them uh, trying to be more flexible, but we can certainly look at it. And I don't know if Director Walker is on and she wants to, to speak to the question a bit more. Or uh, Mr. Russell from DPW. Thank you, County Executive. Uh, yeah, we are aware of the area and uh, we encourage, you know, the get your information in the Gabby or you could go to the county website and we actually have the application right on site. Um, fill it out and our folks our tra transportation folks will have a look at it and like the county executive said we we are looking at all these more aggressively than we have in the past okay anita from facebook when will the pal center come to middle river not soon enough right councilwoman that's right <laughs> Okay. Um, um, Chief, Chief Russell, thank you for that answer. And uh, I don't know if Director Johnson is on and wants to speak to the PAL Center time, uh, timeline a little bit. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. CE. That's an excellent question and all inquiring minds want to know. So um, we anticipate it will be next year. We are nearing our 60% um, design for um, the facility. 
And I think once we unveil the final design to the facility, uh, to the facility, I think the community is going to be blown away. We're looking at um, having a STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math emphasis there, and tying in um, the airport um, with the Middle River community. So you're in for a real treat. Um, but we anticipate it'll be next year is the answer to that question. And we're hoping it'll be the middle of next year, not the end of next year, but more to come. Stay tuned. Once we know, we'll certainly let you know. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I'm so excited, especially about the uh, the program we're tying into uh, Glen L. Martin and the State Airport. That is just fantastic. It's amazing to me that um, the students that are in the Middle River area, that that's not taught as a part of their history. I'm very surprised by that because um, there's so much of that history uh, uh, pre and post World War II for the uh, communities, most of the communities there, especially like Arrow Acres is a planned community, the first planned community itself that came out of Glen L. Martin. So um, I'm really excited. So I'm hoping, you know, earlier than later. <laughs> We have a message from Charlie. Uh, my message is simple. Please increase funding for land preservation. My priorities for sustaining the land preservation are, number one, continue efforts to reinstate the county rural legacy and agricultural preservation programs by committing a minimum of 1% of the capital budget to preservation programs. Number two, preserve farms under imminent threat and key properties with limited development potential. Number three, Fund local land trusts that provide services to the county by identifying properties for preservation and accepting perpetual stewardship role of preserved properties. Number four, maximize the effective use of local side Maryland program open space funds by prioritizing projects identified in and the adopted land preservation parks and recs plan. Keep up the great work. Thank, thank you, Charlie. Uh, and I appreciate the, that that continued push. Uh, as I mentioned in the remarks, we did in fact this year double our investment in uh, uh, ag preservation, land preservation programs, two to four million. Uh, I have projected out our goal is to then increase it over the next two referenda cycle to double it again, so to go from four million this year to six million in 2022, and then to eight million in 2024. Uh, so we are committed there. We're proud of the work that we're doing to identify great parcels under our POS program and the additional 35 million to, to upgrade our rec, our rec facilities. Um, is anyone on from the Department of Planning either direct or direct planning want to speak a little bit to the program and our, our efforts here? Mr. County Executive, this is Steve Lafferty. Happy to sort of add on to what you've just said is that recently we took before the County Council 13 farms to bring into our Ag Preservation Program. As you pointed out, uh, with your commitment to increasing the money, we're well above a 1% uh, increase annually. Uh, we will also be presenting to the County Council in the near future five communities that are, are five areas that are engaged in rural legacy uh, efforts to protect more and more of the lands. We still have an 80,000 acre uh, goal that we're working towards and uh, the staff and planning department is, is committed to working with Charlie and the land trusts uh, and Jones and the others to make sure that uh, land preservation remains uh, at the top of our agenda. Can I just thank Charlie uh, for his volunteerism over the, I, I want to say many years, but I'm sure it's about decades, uh, <laughs> all the years that he has given to uh, land preservation. And I mean, he's out there getting his hands dirty. He just doesn't show up for meetings and, um, and, and talk about it. He actually goes out and teaches folks and he shows up in so many communities across Baltimore County uh, to let people know how they can pitch in and how they can help. Uh, so I know that Baltimore County is very grateful uh, for the work that he has done in his partnership. Thank you, Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. Christy from Facebook asks, with hybrid learning starting this week, 
is there any word on when public libraries will reopen? That is a good question. Uh, I don't know. Do we have anyone from the library system on tonight? To yes, speak Mr. There? yes, Mr. C. It's James Cook, Assistant Director of the Library. Hi. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Yes, we are currently in the process of continuing our plans for reopening. Uh, we currently provide curbside service at all of our 19 locations, as well as computer appointments inside our branches. Uh, so we encourage uh, residents to take advantage of those services. We are looking at developing plans for uh, the next phase of our reopening, which will include uh, opening branches for browsing, which we know customers are very interested in. So uh, stay tuned for that. We're hoping to share some of that information in the coming weeks. Okay, Melissa asks, how is Baltimore County ensuring that vulnerable populations have access to the COVID vaccine? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Melissa. This is a, a huge uh, issue and thrust for Dr. Branch and Dell Leister, our deputy health officer over on HHS. Um, and I, in addition to uh, some of the work I mentioned earlier about the, the specific uh, plan for uh, opening up a mass vac site in Randallstown and having our faith community leaders join us for that. I know there's a lot of other work going on. So Della or Doc, if you're on. This is Dr. Branch. I am here. I'm hey. Excellent question. Hey. Um, I think it's very important to understand that um, you're not successful um, when it comes to um, um, giving out your vaccines um, um, just because you just put it in, in all people's arms. I think you have to be successful and that you've got to put it into the arms of black and brown people and also of vulnerable people. And so we are working towards that now. We're working with our 75 and older group at this particular time. We're working with the Department of Aging who are helping them to actually make the appointments, speaking to them on the phone and making the appointments for them. Um, we're gonna be work we're working with our homebound folks. So we'll be going out to homebound people and, and, and actually giving them the um, injections. We're working with the um, churches at this particular time because we wanna make sure that we get the vaccine into the neighborhoods where people are so they don't have to travel as far. We're also giving the transportation um, to folks who are trying to get out to our vaccine clinics that they don't have the transportation. As the CE mentioned, they can call 311. So we've got multiple um, ideas and multiple programs that are going on so we can get the vaccine into the vulnerable um, populations in Baltimore County. And, and uh, credit to Dr. Branch and partnership with my chief of staff, we are also in the process of hiring for a COVID-19 health equity manager. Um, to partner both with HHS and the executive office to make sure that we are uh, looking at these these exact issues and supporting Dr. Branch and his incredible work that he's doing all, already. Thank you for that question, Melissa. Can, can I say a few words to Dr. Branch? Do you mind? Please. Dr. Branch, <clears throat> thank you so much on behalf of not just the citizens of Baltimore County, but in my district. You have been amazing. Everyone that I have talked to, whether it's been on social media or they reached out to my office or just when I bump into people who have already had their vaccines or had to take a family member to get their vaccine, said it was so well organized. Everyone was so nice. The wait wasn't long and that they could tell that the people were, were just such caring people. And I know that you even have golf carts picking people up at their cars and taking them to the entrance and really calling ahead for people with disabilities that it's gonna be really tough for them, you know, to get into the Cal Palace. And um, I just wanna say you're doing an extraordinary job. I am so grateful you are our health officer right now during this past year. Um, it's just been tremendous to watch you work your way through this and the entire health department. Uh, so I know that you probably hear it from people all the time, but I can't say it enough. People are grateful um, for your leadership in the health department and the way that this has been expedited. And of course, folks know that we can only give the vaccines when available, you know, what we receive, um, but it's just the way that it's been handled under the circumstances and people really do appreciate it during this difficult time. So thank you. 
My mother always said that when someone compliments you, just say thank you. And so I'm going to say thank you. But I do have to say that I've got a wonderful and extraordinary team um, who, who are the, actually the engines to that wheel. So thank you. And thanks to Mr. CE, because you are a great leader in helping us to do all of this. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Doc. Thanks, thanks Councilwoman. You thank all the folks there in your agency for us. Dr. Branch, thank you. And there was a fun story about one of Dr. Branch's rock stars, Terry Sapp, uh, yesterday, front page of the Baltimore Sun. His experience as a roadie for Twisted Sister helped him <sighs> become very strong in logistics, and you're seeing the benefit of that. We've been hel held up as a statewide, if not national model, and it is a real something we're all very proud of in Baltimore County for our vaccination clinics. Just give us more doses, but we'll get them out. And this is... <laughs> Okay, Christy from YouTube asks, I'm the president of Hawthorne Civic Association. We've seen increased illegal dumping. Is there a plan to bring back bulk pickup? It was discontinued in 1992. Without bulk pickup, many residents don't have options for proper disposal of large items. Christy, thank you for your leadership in Hawthorne. Really appreciate um, all that you do. Thank you for your question. Um, I will be completely honest, bulk trash pickup is one of the things I hope to see us bring back um, while I'm county executive. Uh, we have had our share of challenges. My, my first year, we inherited the $81 million deficit. This year, we had $100 million in cuts because of COVID. Um, and so we'll be looking at the budget this year, but having that feedback is very helpful in terms of trying to prioritize the limited resources we hope and expect to have. As, as part of this budget process. But uh, Councilwoman has also indicated her support for this. I'll let her say that as well. And then if anyone, uh, if uh, Chief Russell wants to add anything from the DPW's perspective, we can add that as well. Uh, thank you, Christy, for your, for your leadership. And I do know this is an issue all through Baltimore County. And I do think by bringing back bulk pickup, we would have less and less illegal dumping um, in our dark you know, one way uh, streets and wooded areas for for sure. Um, so I'm hoping that that will be something that we can budget for um, in the future. And I, I do remember when we had it back in the day. And um, it, I think it is a way of keeping things out of our alleyways, our roadways and, and keeping illegal dumping down. So um, uh, thank you for bringing that up. I certainly appreciate it. Oh, Mr. County Executive. Mayo. Yes, um, just <clears throat> for the listening audience, we have engaged in a uh, solid waste work group over the last few months since November and a solid waste um, effort in terms of bulk pickup is one of our recommendations coming forward very soon to you. All right. Okay, we have... Four people ask this question. Oh boy. My concerns are great regarding the Powell farm space. Does this restricted period, during this restricted period, has been imperative for people to have their open air green space to walk, exercise, and grow vegetation? This area has experienced problems with storm drains, repairing roads, updating the infrastructure. We are experiencing an overwhelming and great overwhelming and greater wildlife with the destruction of green space. The subway is close to the location that increases foot and automobile, automobile traffic. I think this might not actually be for District 6. Um, unless Kathy, you, Councilwoman Bevins, you can say I, otherwise. I, are they talking about the amount of green space that the PAL Community Center is going to take up? Um, no, it's PAHL farm space. But let's move on to the next question because I, I believe this is actually on the west side. Okay. Um, well, District 2. I, I, yeah, w w w but we also want to just try to respond to questions as well. Um, so if you'll indulge, I, I think we can talk a little bit about um, Director Johnson. If you want to talk a little bit about our open space efforts and, and work there, and then uh, I think Director Lafferty already answered the question about. Um, preservation, but maybe just talk about some of the work we're doing to try to preserve uh, farms. And then in terms of development decisions, a lot of those are determined by zoning. 
Um, and so since it's not in district six, that would not have been a zoning decision uh, by the council for this meeting. So I think we do have a council district two meeting coming up uh, where we can talk more about the zoning for those uh, that particular project, but um, it might be beneficial to just talk a little bit about our program open space planning and what we're trying to do to preserve open space, uh, Director Johnson. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. CE. Excellent question. Um, Pals Farm is the farm, it's private property currently, and it's located in Pikesville. And so that's a property that we're looking at um, as a potential acquisition. Um, we're looking at all properties as potential acquisition. As the county executive mentioned, um, we have an un unexpended amount of program open space funding, um, where half of it is is allocated to acquisition. And so the county executive, um, the administrative officer and the senior executive team have been moving barriers out of the county's way so that we can acquire more uh, more parkland and more open space for residents. Um, during this pandemic, we've had the largest increase in park usership than any other jurisdiction in the state. We had a 224% increase in park usership, and that's based on the COVID-19 Google mobility data. Um, so everyone, residents in Baltimore County are showing their interest with their feet, and we love it um, as, a parks and rec as a recreation and parks department. We're very happy about that, but it um, has shown us that we do need to try to acquire as much open space as possible, um, so I'm grateful to the county executive and Madam AO for helping us remove all those barriers so we can acquire this pro these um, various properties throughout the county, and we are using program open space funding to be able to do that and trying to spend down our balance. So thank you. Thanks, Director Johnson. Okay. Can the county push for MDOT to improve ADA accessibility on Bel Air Road and a Bel Air Road streetscape? What can be done to reinvigorate the Overly Fullerton community plan and promote reinvestment in the area? Something I spent a lot of time talking with Councilwoman Evans, com community leaders, Gabby about. Um, we absolutely support uh, the state doing more. We have actually continually asked for this to be a priority of ours on our letter to the to MDOT um, for more investment along that corridor. Um, Chief Russell, do you want to add anything, um, or anyone else who wants to speak to the efforts along that corridor? Thank you, County Executive. I know uh, Director DeAndrea Walker has been uh, interacting with the state on this, and we've really been pushing for the upgrades as well as, you know, our own upgrades throughout the county. So we will continue to push on, on this front as well. We, we appreciate uh, the question. Thank you. Fullerton Elementary is overcrowded, and while a new elementary school will be built at some point, this needs to be addressed. What funding is available to support Fullerton Elementary and its students? Uh, great question. Um, in addition to the, I, I don't know if it's, uh, actually, this might be a good good chance to turn, turn you in, in over to uh, Jennifer Lynch. Dr. Lynch is our new Director of Educational Partnerships. Um, I will say, in addition to the money we put forward to finish schools for our future, uh, maybe Dr. Lynch will talk a little bit about the My I Pass and what that hopes to do for all of our schools to identify the needs out there, which would probably include Fullerton, given the overcrowding issues that are out there. Oh, oh Mr. County Executive, is... Mr. Is Director Blades from Yes, sir. Fine. <laughs> Um, from the budget perspective, we uh, we are underway in phase two of the My I Pass, uh, the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Uh, we have the high school recommendations that are in being considered in the FY22 uh, budget formulation process, and we hope by the fall um, to have a full report which includes all the middle schools, all the elementary schools, and special special schools, and Fullerton will be captured in all the elementary schools, and uh, decisions will be. Uh, made about where that falls in the process for uh, improvements and additional capacity and, and, and everything else as Canon Design moves through their evaluation process. Uh, thank you for that um, explanation, Mr. Blaze. I appreciate it. Um, I just want to make it clear to everyone that 
uh, with mentioning Fullerton Elementary School, there are seven, seven trailers in front of Fullerton Elementary School. And there has not been any development, so to speak, in that area at all. Um, it's really just been a turnover of older folks moving out. You know, the, most of the housing in that area is generational. Uh, families love it there and they stay. And um, But a lot of older folks have um, uh, uh, passed on, moved on, um, and younger families have moved in. And it's just a really vibrant community now. Um, and it's very diverse and it's just, and, and it's such a great school. And, but seven trailers is a bit much. And now, um, not in my district, but in David Mark's district in the fifth district, uh, there's a PUD underway of over uh, 800 homes. And those children will, unless the boundaries uh, change with the new elementary schools uh, that will be built, um, there are 800 homes and those children are slated for Fulton Elementary School. So it's a problem. Yeah. Okay. Well, and I'll just add, you know, I started my career as a teacher in this county and uh, it was in a trailer. It was in one too many trailers. It was insufficient to me. It's what, what we want to get away from, uh, which is why we're doing the My I Pass so that we have a long-term plan um, that accounts for all of our communities, not just those that are loudest and can advocate for themselves. So I assure you, uh, I fully expect that this school will be included in the My iPass recommendations. Thank you. Amanda, you're muted. Can the county put more funding into code enforcement to hire more officers so that cases can be addressed more efficiently? Can money from code enforcement cases be put back into code itself? So I actually believe that code, uh, there is some money from code that goes back to uh, PAI. Uh, I don't believe that the, the amounts cover the full cost, so we supplement it with, with um, funds. Um, I actually believe this came from someone who may have served on the, on the task force. It was the question I saw. So thank you for your service on the on the task force. We are still working to watch to try to implement those recommendations. I fully believe in the need for more. This is something that uh, back when I was a delegate representing Southeast Baltimore County was an issue and a problem. So we are committed to it as well. Um, I think we have Director Pete Gutwald on who is uh, – still relatively new as the director of uh, PAI, who can speak to some of the code issues and, and the, the opportunities there. And I think if I saw his budget correct, his budget requests correctly, he did include uh, some positions as part of his submission for consideration this year. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Yes, I'm here um, and you are correct. <laughs> we did ask for additional uh, funding for additional individuals. We are also trying to leverage, uh, you know, think outside the box and leverage funds to do more code enforcement uh, throughout the county and be a little more proactive in it. Um, I am working with some other individuals and in, in Terry Hickey and in, in, um, Office of Housing and Community Development to try and leverage some federal dollars to increase our abilities to do more code enforcement. So it is on our radar. We are trying, we are familiar with, you know, we are working towards a lot of the things that came out of that task force. I'm going through it and um, trying to figure the ways to the best way to implement them as fast as we can. So thank you for the question. Caitlin from Facebook asks, where would the new park open space in District 6 be? Would it, could it correlate to Northeast Trail? Hmm. So I believe um, the council will be voting on it soon. Uh, I typically don't announce the acquisitions uh, until they're, they're finished. Uh, so, but I will. I, I am not the council, so if Councilwoman Be Bevins wanted to speak to the uh, the property, I will certainly defer to her. Um, but if there is a connection possibility, we certainly want to explore it. Yes. Um, no, if you don't want to let the goods out of the bags, I don't either. 
Um, but I, I it's the, it's the, totally up to you, Councilwoman. And I, the one thing I can mention, though, as far as some parkland uh, that just recently uh a developer has um and this is another part of uh the district but it's on bird river road uh a little uh, uh a new park will be going in there with a playground and perhaps a pavilion and um the folks down there are really thrilled about it and um you know it's a uh, it's a great la uh, land donation and uh so it's a little bit more i know that um most of the homes down that way sit on an acre but you know and have big backyards, but they really don't have uh, a park unless they go down to like Eastern Regional or over to Marshall Point. So I'm really excited about that as well. And you know, my hope is that one day all these trails can um, uh, can come together and be con contiguous. Wouldn't that be fantastic to put on your hiking shoes or uh, hop on your bicycle? Um, whether by yourself or with your family, and just be able to get from Perry Hall uh, to Middle River uh, to Essex and to Rosedale, and um, just be able to bike and, and walk those areas. So um, I would love to see that in our, our bikes, uh, uh, bicycle and pedestrian commission works very hard on looking at those issues and I guess working with uh, uh, rec and parks and planning. So um, I think that uh, a lot of people are really into you know, getting to our, our parks and then exploring and just not being in one area. So I'm hoping uh, county executive that um, that we're around long enough to see that happen, that we connect to our communities. I have definitely issued that challenge to Director Johnson. Uh, <laughs> is that not right, Roz? You absolutely have, Mr. County Executive, um, so much so that we are doing a master plan for the entire Recreation and Parks Department. Um, the last master plan was done in 1950, which was a very good year. However, it was 70 years ago. So um, we are excited to um, get that started, and that will be a full community input process. So um, we want to hear from the community what their priorities are, and so more to come on that. So Councilwoman, we have the right uh, leader in Rec and Parks who's up to the challenge. If anyone can do it, I think uh, Director Johnson can. So um, I'm really, I'm really, I'm really, really excited to hear that. And yeah, uh, that's a long uh, 70 years. Yeah, I think we're due. <laughs> Let's get on that. <laughs> okay. Scott from Facebook asks With the amount of waterfront on the east side, what is the county doing to plan for and address sea level rise due to climate change? To be more clear, I mean addressing the impacts. Thanks, Scott. Great question. Uh, as someone who grew up on the water on the east side, it's uh, something very personal to me. Um, and so in addition to what we're doing to combat climate change in the county with the methane capture, uh, solar exploration, energy efficiencies, um, things like the BGE uh, electric vehicle charging stations, uh, before he became director of planning, uh, Steve Lafferty was um, leading these environmental efforts. So I'm going to actually turn it over to him to talk a little bit more about sea level and climate change and what the county has started under his leadership in his uh, environmental his environmental stewardship role uh, before becoming director of planning. Uh, we are act actively hiring for his replacement, and we look forward to continuing that work as well. Thank you, Mr. County Executive. Um, I think that that's a, a really important question, particularly for those who do live either on the water or or near the the water, particularly the Chesapeake and and the other tributaries. Um, we have undertaken a uh, an analysis and a study of what we're going to do, particularly at the outset for county-owned assets due to sea level rise, uh, and we know that a lot of properties. Um, and I'm not sure where uh, where you live, but you know, in Bowley's quarters and Turner Station and many other communities are constantly challenged by sea level rise. Um, we know that uh, Environmental Protection and Sustainability Department has undertaken a number of projects to actually create um, basically soft shorelines that can mitigate the impacts along a lot of the waterways. And as we also try to support the rural legacy, the coastal rural legacy area, buying more property that actually can mitigate the impacts as well. 
um, it's a big challenge and we have to encourage more property owners to take actions themselves to reduce the impacts, uh, try to build further back from the water, uh, perhaps even create what's called greater freeboard so that you're not uh, actually jeopardizing the properties um, and uh, find some other strategies. You know, our, one of the next steps that I know the county executive is committed to is looking community-wide at how we deal with not only riverine flooding, inland flooding, but those of you who do live al uh, along the waterfronts um, and really welcome your input as to what strategies you think we should be undertaking uh, because it's going to continue to be a challenge. You know, we have been fortunate to have some good consultants work with us to begin to develop some strategies, uh, but we're really only at the front end of this because uh, unfortunately, actions had not been taken to sufficiently prepare us for what we're going to be facing over the next 10 or 20 years. And uh, our work has only started within the last couple of years, uh, but we're going to continue, I know, throughout the balance of the uh, administration time in, in office to find some other solutions. So once again, if you have some other ideas, if you can feed them through Gabby Slocum, and then I'm more than happy to work with Gabby and others to help develop some good answers for you. Uh, do you mind if I uh, bring up at this time, since we're talking about um, our waterfront and uh, it really doesn't have, well, I guess it's all tied in. I would like uh, everybody to just read, um, well, a lot of our citizens don't know about some nonprofit organizations that we have that you can be involved in in working on cleaning up the waterways and learning about how to preserve your property and keep things um, away from um, going into the water. And that is the Back River Restoration Committee, and they're located in Essex. Um, they not only um, go out on the weekends and all summer long and actually pull things out of our waterways and all of the uh, streams leading from the Herring Run. Uh, we also have the Maryland Waterway Foundation under, Steve, um, under Sam Weaver's leadership. And all these organizations are always looking for volunteers and they're not just about getting garbage and trash out of the waterways. They teach about rain barrels and, and rock gardens and really how to protect, uh, I do a better job on your property, you know, about where to wash your car and how to water your plants and things like that. So uh, some folks are always looking for volunteer um, positions and for their children to get community service hours. And I think Mr. Laffrey, you would agree, these are two great organizations um, that are just hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that are out there trying to um, make our waterways um, enjoyable for everyone. Ken Executive, can I jump in for a second? This is Dave Likens from Environmental Protection and Sustainability. I just want to say that we do provide grants to both of those organizations that Councilman mm -hmm. Evans just mentioned. And I want to thank everybody involved in both of those organizations because they provide thousands of hours. I mean, thousands of hours of their own time to go out every weekend sometimes and collect trash and debris. And on the um, Back River Restoration Committee, there's a trash boom that they collect hundreds of thousands of pounds of trash that come down the river. I mean, these people are selfless and go out throughout the whole year and do a great job. And I just want, on behalf of our organization, I'd like to thank them for all the hours they put in. Thank you, Mr. Likens. As a yeah, no, they're, they're, they're awesome organizations. And Councilwoman Bevins and I have spent our fair share of time getting our our hands and our feet muddy alongside them. They really do great work. And I want to thank uh, the department for uh, their support of the efforts. I had a fight with a tire once and the tire won. <laughs> <laughs> when, once they're stuck, they're stuck. I found that out. <clears throat> As a follow-up to the last question, Monica from YouTube asked, are there any plans to help the erosion problems for Stemmers Run Stream that runs through several parks within District 6. Thanks, Monica. It's almost like you knew Director Likens was uh, itching to talk more, so. Uh, Monica, again, this is Dave Likens. Thank you for that question. 
I don't off the top of my head know uh, where Stemmer's run stream restoration projects are. I know that they're on our list of things that we evaluated. Um, I can't tell you right off the top when we'll be getting there and when, what, when they're in the queue to be done. But um, if you want to send me an email specifically or have Gap, talk to Gabby, um, dlikens at baltimorecountymd.gov, I'll be more than happy to uh, look up and see exactly when uh, the Stemmers Run Stream Restoration projects are going to be uh, in the queue. Okay, I think our last question for the night. Um, during this pandemic, I'm sorry, this is Frank. He says, during this pandemic, all the trials we have had, are you planning to raise our property taxes? Frank, the answer is no. We are not doing that. We're going to continue making investments um, to support our teachers and educators and students and families and communities. And we're going to do it without raising any revenue. I'm really proud of what we've done this year. Um, so any other questions, Amanda? That was our last question. Okay, very good. Um, Councilman Bevins, any uh, final words tonight? I just want to say thank you again for the opportunity. And I hope that um, having some of these questions answered in this uh, fashion um, help folks out. Um, some folks who just feel so isolated with not getting to their community meetings, you know, at the, the, in their cafeteria, in their elementary school. And some have been doing them virtual um, and trying to keep up, but this is a good way of getting uh, inf information out. And I really appreciate it. And I'm just really thankful. You know, I look around the district and um, I, I look at things every day and say, how can we make this better? Or, hey, look at that. That's that's new. And and people appreciate that. And, um, you know, it's just uh, been amazing in 10 years and under the last uh, few years of your leadership, um, the things that are happening around the county. And, um, you know, it's nice. This is why I love that local government. You get to see things actually come into fruition. Uh, you know, something you've asked for or advocated for 10, eight years ago, uh, you may see by year 10. And that's, that has happened sometimes with some of our schools. And it's been a process. And But we're going to get there. And I certainly appreciate the partnership that I have with you and the entire county council. I think it's uh, you've really been a breath of fresh air as far as transparency and uh, people knowing uh, that you're going to be in their communities. You're going to have uh, venues like this for people to participate in and not always have to uh, send an email. And um, they really like this. So I'm glad that you're going around the county uh, doing it again. So I just want to thank all the great directors that are on board again that um, you know, work under the county executive. You do a phenomenal job uh, working with my, my office as well. And I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And um, um, just keep up the good work, county executive, because I'm really proud of the work that's been done over the last couple of years. And look, any, I say this all the time, anybody can do this job when there's tons of money and everybody's getting everything they want and it's happy, happy, happy. It's really how you get through this when times are hard, when they're tough. And it really shows um, your leadership uh, skills and, and how you, you know, have um, maneuvered through it. So um, it's been difficult, but you've just uh, done a great job. And I'm grateful for um, the partners on the county council. And I don't know how we do it without our communities. You know, we can't be the eyes and ears in each one of our neighborhoods all the time. And I'm so grateful. Um, I hate when they call and say, I'm sorry to bother you, but I say, it's no bother. That's what we're here for. We want to know about your pothole. We want to know about the fence that fell down. We want to know about the uh, wash machine that was dumped at the end of your street last night. We need to know these things. Uh, we we don't want to be reactive. We want to be a proactive government, right? Uh, so we really want to be working with folks all the time. And I, I, I just really enjoy that you ask people what they would like to see and that we are that kind of government now. So thank you so much, John. I certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Kath. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be your partner, Councilwoman Evans. And, uh, you know, honestly, 
your support and partnership has been critical in weathering all of the crises we face, including this most recent one. So thank you for your friendship and for your partnership. Um, thanks to all the directors and uh, representatives of, of county government tonight for your partnership and for your leadership. Uh, and most importantly, thanks to our residents who tuned in tonight, who submitted questions, who are engaging in this process. We're very proud uh, to be a government that asks what you think and tries our very best to incorporate it. So I hope everyone is staying safe. Uh, keep your distance, wear your mask, get your vaccine when you're eligible. Hopefully we're coming out of this soon. We're going to get through this together and uh, looking forward to seeing everyone in person sooner rather than later. So stay safe, everybody, and have a great night. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.